What's up? What's up? Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show because building extra income streams is the best way to recession proof your life. Action packed episode for you today on earning passive royalties from products you create, courting influencers, and even erasing sloth. You're about to meet Matt Ralph from MattRalphTheWriter.com. He's a children's book author out of England whose self publishing journey started as a side hustle, and his best selling work to date is Sam the Speedy Sloth. Stick around in this one to learn about the children's book creation process in the most effective ways Matt has found to market his books, earning thousands of dollars in royalties and Amazon author rewards in the process. Now, because there are quite a few steps to go from idea to successful book launch, I put together a self-publishing project checklist, something I go through for each and every one of my own books, which I'm actually working on finalizing a new title. I'm excited to share with you guys. But you can grab that checklist for free at SideHustleNation.com slash kids books, all one word, to make sure you don't miss a step along the way. That link is also where you'll find the full text summary and all the resources mentioned in this episode with Matt. Once again, that's at SideHustleNation.com slash kids books. I'll be back after this call with Matt. Ready? Let's do it. I've always been interested in writing. When I was little, I always was writing stories and things like that. And I think I've got quite a vivid imagination. Or So that's what my parents have always told me. And one day I was in the airport. And this would have been in 2017 or 18. And I saw a poster for a sloth. And I just, for some reason, I just thought it would be funny to have a children's book that had a sloth that was quick or speedy, because that's very opposite to what a sloth normally is. And suddenly, while I was on the plane, I obviously didn't really have anything to do because you can't use your phone or anything like that on the plane. The first line of my book just sort of flashed into my mind uh, about this speedy sloth. And, you know, in the rainforest of South America, deep is a curious creature, most often asleep. And that just sort of, the, the rhyme just sort of banged straight into my head. And I thought, well, I've got to write this down. So I I got out my phone, obviously on aeroplane mode, and just wrote down and it just sort of, it just sort of started coming out. Uh, and then I wrote probably 60, 70%, something like that on the flight. And then I sort of tightened it up. And Okay, I love this. So first of all, airplanes, great place for productivity, You're just trapped, you can't move anywhere. There's no internet. Some of my most productive writing time happens on uh, airplanes. You draft the thing, most of it on the flight, and you start shopping around for traditional publishers and you get rejected or or do you go straight to the self-publishing path? No, I did go down the traditional publishing route because, I mean, I, I think because that's the, the idea people have in their minds, I suppose, when you think of the really famous authors, they all, most of them are traditionally published, or at least the ones that I, you know, the ones that I knew. But also, I think it was also a cost thing because obviously a traditional or a traditional publisher would usually do all of the illustrations and pay for all the marketing and they, they basically do most of it for you. So I did go down that route, but I unfortunately didn't get anywhere with it. I then explored the self-publishing route and that's when I decided that was what I was going to do. Yeah, this is the problem because I've got at least two children's books in my head, but the problem is I'm not in fact, far from it being a qualified illustrator to turn this thing into reality. Because my kids, they're three and five, they look whenever I'm reading a book, an adult book, a grown up book, they look at it and say, Does it have any pictures? And then they're like immediately bored with it. It's like, There's no pictures here. It's a book with no pictures. We're out. What was the process like for finding somebody to draw it? Or did you draw it yourself to illustrate it yourself? No, unfortunately, I'm not artistically inclined in that way. So no, I I can't draw. I knew from the start, I wouldn't be illustrating it. So what I did was, I actually discovered I'd never used it before, but I discovered Fiverr.com, which people probably are familiar with. It's a, you know, a marketplace for freelancers, freelance services. And it's, it's relatively low cost most of the time. And I started looking around and looked at people's, uh, the different freelancers that offered illustrations and checked out their profiles, looked at some of their work. Obviously, I had an idea in my head of what I wanted the illustrations to be like in terms of, I quite like the traditional watercolor style, hand drawn. So that's, I chose an illustrator who did that for my first book, which was um, Sam Speedy Sloth. And I did also, I had done a book before that, which I had actually illustrated using sort of stock images on canva.com. But that was a slightly different book. That was my first ever book. It was called Go On, Press It. 
and it had a big red button on the front and it said, you know, every page says, do this action, like knock on the door. And then the next page shows what the reaction is. So someone opening the door or pressing the button and that causes a rocket ship to blast off or whatever. So I did that all using effectively, I guess, clip art, sort of, you know, like a nicer version of clip art. But for the Sam the Speedy Sloth, I wanted to really fully illustrate it and have it done professionally. I mean, I just like this idea of doing this Canva, kind of this interactive book. We've got a few of those too. Where it's like push the button, shake the book up and down, see what happens on the next page. Kids are, are definitely into that. That's a creative way to get it done. Now for your Fiverr illustrator, did you say, okay, I need 40 pages? Was it, I can I get a sample of your work? Like what was the initial outreach or interaction like? So I did one illustration as a test so that's what I would recommend people do that with most services, especially if you're committing to quite a big order. I got her to do one illustration for me just to test out what it was like, what her services were going to be like. I wanted to make sure we could work together and the language barrier wasn't going to become a difficulty. But it was fine. She's really good. She pretty much got it nail on the head each time. I sort of told her what I wanted each illustration to look like, and then she just brought that to life. I think with writing children's books, often, even if you're not the illustrator, you still have to come up with effectively a storyboard in your mind. Some illustrators might do that themselves. But for me, I wanted it to be my vision. So I came up with, the, I sort of said, you know, in this image, I want the sloth to be doing this thing. I want, you know, these in the background. I want, you know, and I told her basically what I wanted exactly to be like. And then she just took my words, my description, and made it into an illustration. Right. Whenever it's something subjective, like design or, or art like this, trying to set them up for success, like as best as you can, describe your vision. I don't know about you. I'm always a little bit nervous when I get those Fiverr notification emails, your order is ready. And it's like, oh, do I really want to click on that? You know, because sometimes it comes back and you're like, oh, this is not what I had in mind at all. But it sounds like this was the opposite experience. This was positive. Yeah, it was very positive. I, obviously, they were backwards and forwards in quite a lot. But I think it was more getting into a rhythm. And I think sometimes, you know, maybe I wasn't clear enough at the start, or perhaps she misunderstood what I meant exactly. But it was fine. It was, it was obviously a little bit bumpy at times when you have to go backwards and forwards four or five times just because you want one thing changing. But it's very difficult to explain it without doing it yourself. It was mostly fine. She's really talented. And, you know, does great work. So uh, I was very, very pleased with the outcome. It's interesting. This was your introduction to Fiverr because now you're a Fiverr pro seller as a service provider yourself with editing services and self-publishing support on there. But turning to it first as a customer, what was the approximate cost for the full book illustrations for Sam the Speedy Sloth? It was several hundred dollars. It worked out to be but that was just the illustration. So I actually, because there's an interactive section at the end of my book, plus also all of the other pages. So there's, for example, at the end of Sam the Speedy Sloth, at the end of the actual story, there is an interactive section with spot the difference, a word search, um, fact files for each of the animals. So I put all of that together using Canva. Okay. And... So obviously I pay for Canva Pro to do that because you get more access to more images and you know things like that. But I'd say the full book, to get it from just uh, notes on my phone to an actual finished product was probably somewhere in the region of somewhere between two to three, four hundred dollars, something like that. Okay, that's not bad. Um, it's a pretty lean startup. For me as a first time author, never having done this before. I didn't know how much profit I was going to make, if any, how it was going to work. Obviously, as soon as you spend money, it means you've got to make that money back in order to just break even, let alone make a profit. Was there any sort of competitive analysis on sloth books for kids or keyword research or anything that went into kind of the market validation side of things? Like, I think there's demand for this. So I'm going to go ahead and plunk down the $400 to go in and build it. I had the idea before anything else, because like I said, I wrote it on the plane. It just, it kind of came to me. It was very random. I didn't expect to write a children's book. But once I had written it, I thought, well, I wonder if there's another book that's similar to mine, as in, I'm sure there are sloth books, but are there ones about a speedy sloth or a sloth that runs, something like that. And I looked on Amazon and... 
there was a couple of books that were sort of similar, but I certainly didn't copy them because I wasn't even aware they existed. So I did I did some market research just to make sure it wasn't 100% similar or anything. And it wasn't, you know, they were very different storylines, I suppose. Obviously, sloth is, you know, it's a cute animal. Children's books usually use cute animals and funny rhymes. So I suppose if, there is going to be some tiny similarities. But yeah, I, I made sure that it was different enough. And then I did some research by going into bookstores and looking at the types of books that were there. And that kind of helped me in terms of how I wanted to present the book, what I wanted the illustrations to look like. And I quite liked this idea of having the interactive section at the back because I found that not that many books did it, but it was something that when when it was in a book, people seemed to really respond to that and write good reviews specifically mentioning that. Yeah, that's a cool idea to make it, you know, add, it adds page count, makes it appear more bulky, more valuable for readers. I think that's a really cool idea to, you know, deepen that relationship and hopefully, you know, maybe they buy the next book and all that other stuff. I want to talk about the, I guess, the design and layout part of this, because for, you know, my self-publishing experience, it's all in nonfiction. It's like, you know, starting with a Word doc and the formatting, aside from, you know, struggling with some images or some other stuff. It's relatively straightforward, but for something like this and making this for Kindle, where, you know, the text, if it's not stored as an image, it's all infinitely adjustable font sizes. It can be, I imagine, a real nightmare to try and make a design layout for Kindle. Although, let me tee it up like that and see what kind of response you have on the design layout side and maybe some follow-ups after that. Sure. So, like I said, I got the illustrations done professionally so that they were provided to me in jpeg or pdf format but once i had that obviously that isn't just the book obviously the book needs to have a title page and um obviously the cover was done by the illustrator as well but there's so many other elements to the book to make it sometimes i think some authors use their illustrator for everything and they just give them effectively a ready-made file but to save on cost i did all the formatting myself. So I created a, a file in Canva with all the illustrations, but then I did all of the title pages, the uh, activity sections, which I mentioned earlier, and everything else that needed to be done. And then it's actually relatively easy with um, Amazon KDP. For print books, you upload a PDF. So that's pretty simple. Okay. So export it from Canva as a PDF and then straight into KDP. Okay. Yes. And obviously, you need to make sure you get the dimensions right. So you need to select your dimensions beforehand to make sure that the PDF is going to be the right dimensions. That part can be slightly tricky. That one sort of came back. I had to go backwards and forwards a couple of times because the margins weren't quite in the right place. So, you know, I, I, I'm quite perfectionist. So I looked through and thought, well, actually, you know, I want this this image to be, you know, half an inch closer to this side or whatever it might be. Uh, The Kindle version is slightly more complicated. The way I did it, again, to save cost, was I downloaded Amazon's uh, free software called Kindle Kids Book Creator. Oh, okay. I didn't know there was such a thing. Yes. It's a really good free programmer. It's probably not the best one out there. It is a little bit clunky. I think it's one of those softwares that they created probably years ago and hasn't been updated since, but it does the job. What effectively it does is you upload the JPEGs of each individual page, and then this program basically sort of converts it into a .mobi file, which is what which is Amazon's own file because you you can't upload a PDF or you're not it suggests you don't do PDFs for Kindle because it does weird stuff to the formatting and it puts pictures you know half on half off the page or you know whatever okay and i want to pause and mention so we mentioned an acronym KDP is Kindle Direct Publishing so kdp.amazon.com is where you set up your self publishing account were you intent on building both the paperback and the Kindle version? I've got to imagine for a kid's book, most of the sales are paperback, but I could be wrong on that. Yes, that is true. I do sell more paperbacks than ebooks, although actually I'm I'm surprised how the ebook actually has done pretty well. And actually part of being on KDP or being on Amazon's um, Kindle Direct Publishing is that one of the options for the Kindle version, so not for the ebook, for the Kindle version only, you can put your book in what's called Kindle Unlimited, which is 
basically almost like Netflix, but for books. It's a subscription-based service that people pay a certain amount of money for, and they get access to all of those books included in their subscription. And as an author, on sort of on the back end of it, you receive money for the page reads that you get. And you also get other benefits like you get to do promotions, like free promotions. So every quarter, as in every three months, you get five days of running your book for free so anyone can download it. And that's a really good way to boost your ratings and get reviews. So that's why I went down that route of using the Kindle almost like a kind of, almost like a a way to get people in like a kind of um, reader magnet was the word I was looking for, sort of, to try and encourage people to get the paperback version as well. Okay. And actually being part of Kindle Unlimited, you also, if your book is in the top, I think it's top 50 books, as in you get the most amount of page reads in that month, you win an an award or a bonus called the All Stars Bonus. And I've won it on several occasions and they're monetary bonuses basically for being in the top 50 or the top 10 or whatever. Oh, wow. Is that like per category or overall? There are two. So there's one for all books, bar illustrated books. But obviously mine was in the illustrated books. So there are only two buckets, if you like. Most books obviously go in the non-illustrated because it's mostly for obviously, you know, um, fictional books or non-fiction, you know, writing books that are mostly text rather than images. But mine was specifically in the illustrated bucket, if you like. Oh, that's cool. That's a little bonus on top of your author royalties. Yes, exactly. And they're quite chunky sometimes. You think if you get to the the number one slot, it's something like twenty five thousand dollars. Wow. <laughs> so obviously <laughs> that's that's huge. I've got into the top ten before, which is it's worth thousands of dollars for bonus. So yeah, that's a really nice top up on top of your royalties. Okay, yeah. Don't discount the ebook version, the Kindle version, even if you're doing a children's book, because it sounds like there are some lucrative incentives to do that. Now, do you you have to give Amazon exclusivity of your book to enroll in this? Like you're not going to distribute through other electronic channels, I think was the terms that I read recently. Yes. The Kindle book only, not the paperback book, has to be exclusive to Amazon to do that. So some people obviously, you know, that's the reason why they don't do it because they don't want exclusivity. But for me, I thought it was worth and having seen the success of doing it with Sam Speedy Sloth and getting I've had several bonuses now from it. It's actually, I don't, I can't imagine I would have sold that many copies on other retailers to make it worth not being exclusive. Yeah. All right. We're about to get into the nitty gritty, juicy marketing stuff. Was there anything specific on the marketing side that you did to promote the Kindle version and climb the ranks of the illustrated books in that way? I often run free promotions, which you can only do if your book is in Kindle Limited. It's one of the perks you get. Like I said, you get five days every three months, so every quarter to run free promotions. And you can split those five days however you want. You can also do what's called Kindle countdown deals, which is where for a, a certain amount of time, your book is discounted. And it will say, you know, you know, you have 24 hours left to get this book at 50% off or whatever. And you can choose one or the other. Either you do free book promotion or you do a countdown deal. You can't do both. I always go with free because... I think you may as well sort of, if you really want to boost your numbers and get good ratings, especially at the beginning, offering something for free is the best way of doing that. What I did was not only did I do the free promotion, but I also went onto Facebook. I went on lots of Facebook groups and posted about my book saying, you know, basically please download my book and obviously trying to sell it a bit more and talking about the, the points of why someone would like it. And I just put in loads of different groups, contacted loads of people on the groups Obviously, people I know, you know, friends and family, leverage them. And also there are some paid promotional sites as well, where you can put your book in a newsletter effectively that goes out to all the subscribers saying today only or tomorrow, you know, whatever, the book is on free promotion. That way you can get lots of downloads. Okay, so this was kind of the launch strategy. Once you've got all of the uh, content written, you've got all the illustrations done, you've got the design and layout to the point that you like it. You've got the interactive content. Like, There's a lot that goes into this creation before you could ever start thinking about the marketing side. But then it's like checking the box for Kindle Unlimited or KDP Select, it used to be called, maybe it still is. Okay, I want to do this free promotion at launch, trying to drum up as much interest as you can during those days. 
was this just, you know, reaching out to groups of parents, like, you know, who might be interested in children's books. So tell me more about this, this launch effort. For Sam and Sylvia Sloth, I didn't quite have a launch plan because I didn't really know what I was doing, frankly. But now what I do is I have a sort of a several pronged approach, if you like. So not only do I do the free download and I do it on promotional sites, like for example, there's BookBub is the biggest one and there's a, there's a few others. So I do that in conjunction with that. I also have Facebook groups, like you said, where, you know, there are lots of Facebook groups where people will sign up to be part of that group if they're interested in free books. I also have a launch team that I've only very recently started. So basically volunteers who are interested in receiving a copy of my book before anyone else does, but they also help me with the process of deciding what the illustrations look like, whether it's a good idea, um, things like that. So they feel really part of the book launch. Okay. Uh, and I also do a lot of um, like social media influencer um, working with them. So on Instagram, for example, a lot of the people I work with, they have a lot of followers and their mothers or fathers or whatever. And their, their audience would be my target audience. So I send them a free copy of the book in exchange for a review on their Instagram page. And they then obviously put a link to my book and it gives me some nice PR and some nice, uh, you know, photos I can use on my website of them reading the book with their children and also leverages their own network as well. Oh, okay. Outside of sending them a free copy, do they typically charge you for that kind of promotion? Sometimes. Some of them do. I've personally not done that because I think there are some people who, I mean, everyone's got to have a side hustle, right? <laughs> Obviously, the name of this podcast. But I personally didn't. I felt like some of them who wanted money, I felt like if you look at a lot of their posts, they were just all ads. And then it kind of dilutes their message a little bit. So I went for kind of mid to lower tier, if you like, people who had lots of followers, but weren't necessarily big celebrities or something like that. Okay. What qualifies as mid-tier in terms of uh, follower count? I would say minimum 10,000, but then probably less than a million. Because if you've got a million followers, I mean, some, I have worked with some people that have more than a million followers um, or people with a blue with a blue tick, for example, it's unlikely they're going to do it probably unless you pay them or unless they know you, you know, trying to get someone like, I don't know, Kim Kardashian, I don't know, so whoever, they're unlikely. They're unlikely to do it unless you pay them a lot, a lot of money, right? Yeah, she's got a couple of kids now, right? Yeah, exactly. So she, I mean, her audience probably would be my target audience. So, you know, Kim, if you're listening, please contact me. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I went, and also I think for me, I wanted my, you know, I'm a self-published author and I want to make sure that my, the way I present myself is that I think I'm a very sort of down-to-earth, real person. I'm not a uh, some sort of celebrity or whatever. So I wanted to go with people who are mothers or fathers or, you know, they, they have children and they're sort of working mothers or whatever. It's mainly mothers that I work with. And I wanted it to be very sort of feel authentic, not something that's really staged. Okay. So that's why I, I went for that. Like I said, those sort of people who have a good number of followers, but they're also really just nice people. And they're actually really kind and generous because you don't want someone who's just doing it for a paycheck or whatever. You want someone who's actually doing it because they like your book. They also help me out with other things, not just, the, you know, not just my one book that I'm working with them on, but they might, I might say, oh, what do you think of this other idea that I'm working on? And they'll say, oh, I'll ask my children what they think, you know, and you kind of almost develop a friendship with them, not just a, a working relationship, it's also a friendship as well. And that was my strategy. How did you go about finding those mid-tier influencers to begin with? I basically just went on Instagram and did a search for terms I thought people would look for. So children's books or... Yeah, well, sometimes I looked for the word mum, mother, mum, or something like that, and then just looked for people who had a decent number of followers and would also were posting stuff that was similar to my book, uh, not just books, but also stuff that would kind of work with books as well. Yeah. So, you know, they, if they talk about children's activities and things, that's obviously a, a natural fit. What was that initial direct message outreach like? It was great. I mean, obviously you've got to accept that not meant not everyone's going to respond and they're not all going to say yes if they do respond most are probably just not going to respond but you know i i, I didn't want to hammer out a load of emails to just millions of people i wanted to really select people who i actually thought would be interested and whose audience would be the right fit 
So I, yeah, I just reached out and said, oh, you know, I really like your account. And, you know, I genuinely meant it. I wasn't just saying it. I, I really like what they were doing and said, I, you know, I saw that you posted about whatever, you know, this other book or something. I'd love to send you a book. I'm a children's book author. You can check out my new book here and send them a link so they can check that it's bona fide. And yeah, and then they, most of the time they just came back and said, yeah, I'd love a copy of your book. And then you just sort of work with them. And I think if you're just nice and polite and actually show that you are a genuine person, you're not just trying to use them for their followers, that you are actually interested in them, uh, then I, most time people, are, you know, they'll reciprocate. Okay, yeah. So you get their address, send them the book. Did you do any follow-up after that? Or just hopefully the product speaks for itself. They read it to their kids, the kids like it, and they kind of naturally post about it after that? When I offered them in the first place, I sort of said, you know, I'd love to send you a book um, in exchange for a review or words to that effect. So I think I made it clear that I would like a review, but I wasn't, obviously I wasn't going to force them. Okay. And now I'm on the Sam the Speedy Sloth listing page here on Amazon, over 200 views with an average five-star rating. So people like the thing. Obviously it's a great book. It's a great product. People are into it. Do you do anything else to encourage or solicit those reviews? Like 200 reviews probably doesn't happen by accident unless you're just moving tons and tons of copies. No. So I, like I said, I did quite a lot of free giveaways and I think that's quite a big chunk. Like I said, I, I got a BookBub feature uh, twice BookBub is basically a newsletter that you can sign up to for free or discounted books. And they're the largest of its kind. They have millions of subscribers. And as an author, you have to pay to have your book included, but BookBub vet everything. So they're really selective about who they pick. And I got selected. So Sam got selected and a few other of my books have been selected. Very cool. And so I, yeah, I was really, really happy about that. And I didn't realize at the time when I actually, I just found BookBub. I just sort of stumbled across it. And as when I was looking for marketing opportunities and when I sort of talked to some other authors who I met in Facebook groups, they were all really, you know, like, oh, I, you know, I've applied three times and never got it or whatever. Yeah, I don't think I've ever been accepted. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I think it's more competitive in certain categories, but still it's very competitive. And I've also had rejections as well. But yeah, so that moved the needle a lot in terms of the reviews or didn't necessarily give me any revenue as such just from that unless people went to buy my other books in the series okay what did it cost you to run those book bub promotions it was between 100 and 200 dollars that's not bad to get in front of a huge email list of potential customers potential reviewers so the strategy if i understand it is you know pump up all these free downloads hopefully get some reviews hopefully send some positive juju to the amazon algorithms so that you start to show up in bestseller lists so that you start to gain some organic. It's hard because I don't know if anybody is necessarily searching for this, but to start to gain just some visibility so that other people start to buy it organically and start to recoup some of your investment. Yeah, exactly. So I, I mean, I, for me, when I was first starting out, I think to see the cost, I don't know, let's say $150 for this newsletter, for me, that was a lot of money because I had not really, I had just launched the book. So obviously I, I was in negative profit because obviously I'd paid for all the illustrations and things. Yeah. So, but then I, I sort of thought about it and obviously having a background in marketing, I sort of, you know, you have to spend money to make money basically. So I, I, I did in, I think I got, I can't remember hundred percent. I think it was like 15,000 downloads in one day. So I thought, well, even if, you know, 1% of those people leave a review, that's quite a lot. Yeah. And reviews, I think, cause when I'm buying products on Amazon, I don't know about anyone else, but if I'm honest, I won't buy a product if it doesn't have good ratings. So I knew that if my book had no reviews or only had, you know, one review or something and it was not a good review, then people are probably are less likely to buy it. So I really wanted to make sure my book had lots of reviews, but they were real reviews. I didn't pay for them. I didn't buy them. They're real people that downloaded them. And all of what they say is completely... I have nothing to do with what they say. It's an honest review. I always say to people, it's an honest review. I never say to someone, oh, please, you know, say this, that, and the other. They they write whatever they want. If they want to write a one-star review, not that I think anyone has, but if they <laughs> want to, that's up to them. They're all verified reviews, um, which means that someone has purchased the product. They haven't just put a review. They've actually purchased it in order to leave the review. Yeah. Okay. And I guess you are getting paid on the page reads for the book because of the Kindle Unlimited. So like, okay. not when you do a free promotion, uh, not okay. when you do a free promotion <laughs> though. 
All right, there's the there's the catch. Yes, exactly. Because you're they're not downloading the Kindle Unlimited version there, and they're effectively buying it for free. So they're just buying your ebook as if they did just buy it normally, like when it's not on free promotion. When you pay, you know, let's say two ninety nine or whatever, okay, you get the book onto your Kindle. They're basically doing that, but without the money transfer. That's all that's happening. So no, you don't get that. So that's why some people don't like doing free promotions because they they see it as being, you know, you're giving away your product for free. But for me, it was I wanted reviews. It helps with the algorithm, and it also gets your book in front of lots of customers. Also, if you have some sort of lead magnet, so for example, I have a newsletter and I give away a free activity book, a sloth-based activity book, uh, if you sign up to my newsletter and I put that front and center in my book. So, And that's also how I built up my newsletter as well. And obviously, newsletters are very important in terms of marketing. Okay, I like that strategy, especially since it's relevant to the audience that is already reading this book. Gives you another touch point because, you know, 15,000 people might download it on Amazon. Amazon is not sharing any of that customer information with you. So you're on your own to try and try and collect that information. What kind of stuff do you send out in this newsletter? Or is it just like, here's my latest book? I'm curious how you nurture that list once they join. They get the free download as soon as they sign up. And quite often it's my new books but it's not just about that. I also, it's, for example, it's if any of you free promotions. Sometimes it's more just generic things like, you know, like, oh, I'd love some feedback on this idea I'm having. And I try and create more of like a community out of my newsletter. So I, I, I try and only send out maybe one a month, maybe two, but I try and make it really sort of inclusive so people can respond if they want to. And they, you know, it's not just a, here's my book, please buy it. I want to try and make it sort of more of a two-sided conversation because I really value their input. It is genuinely interesting and uh, useful for me to hear their feedback on things. What are you using as far as email management service to manage that list? So I created my own website for my books using Wix, which people probably have heard of. It's quite a, it's probably one of the most famous website builders. And they have an email provider, you know, an email service built into that. Okay. Did you have that in place, this lead magnet in place, like when you were first launching? Or is this something like, oh, I better add this after the fact? After the fact. Okay. <laughs> uh, so no, d- definitely, I, I, I wish I had thought of it at the time, but I didn't. Yeah, I mean, when it's difficult. When you're first starting out, you don't really know what you're doing. That's why I think it's important to get advice from professionals and people that have done it before. Um, because, yeah, I, I only had one book out, so I didn't really have anyone to point people to, you know, I would say most of the time, if you probably need a series before you're going to actually start making money because there's the buy through, but, you know, someone buy, they might get book one for free and then they'll buy book two, three, four, right. et cetera. So when you only have one book out, it's sort of where do you, where do they go from there? And I didn't have anything to leverage. So yeah, the newsletter and the uh, lead magnet unfortunately came afterwards. And yeah, I, I wish I had done it first because I could have probably added a lot more people to my mailing list, but at the time, I didn't have one or hadn't thought about how I would leverage it. So my first BookBub deal went out, but I didn't have any lead magnet or anything. Okay. So unfortunately, a lot of those people were lost. But you know, you live and you learn. So oh, Totally. Yeah, there's there's a lot of moving parts in this from, and this is why I have, you know, stood on the sidelines of children's publishing for the last couple of years, because it's like, okay, I've got the idea, but now I got to create the book and like all of these other little steps that go into it, where it's like none of the existing lead magnets that I have wouldn't necessarily be a good fit. So you got to, you know, put all these pieces together. But like Matt said, you don't need, don't necessarily need to have those right out of the gate. You can kind of tack on, this is the beautiful part of self-publishing. You need to make a change. You need to make an edit. You can do it almost instantly versus uh, having to go back to the traditional publisher, order up a new print run, and it could take months. So I like it from that standpoint. I noticed you have so you have the Kindle version, you have the paperback version, which is imagined through KDP print. You also have audiobook and hardcover. Can you tell me about that? I have yet to do a hardcover for any of my books. Yeah. So again, this was something I didn't know about until I started talking to other authors. And I'm now part of lots of Facebook groups for authors and things. And, you know, everyone shares knowledge and things like that. 
I think Amazon has only just started doing print-on-demand hardbacks, but I don't think they're available to the general authors. I think there's only select people. But I use a different company, which is called Ingram, Ingram Spark, which I think it's the largest distributor of books to different retailers. So obviously Amazon is its own retailer, but Ingram Spark goes out to all of the other companies like, for example, Barnes & Noble, in the UK, Waterstones, which is the biggest bookshop, and uh, Walmart, things like that. So I used them. And basically, it's the same process. It's print on demand. You upload your book as a PDF, and they have the option of hardcover. And obviously, one of their retailers is Amazon. So it then distributes via them to Amazon. And then obviously, Amazon, you can link your book so that it comes up as, you know, as part of the speedy slot. When you go on it, it will say, available in all of these different versions it will know that it's the same book you can link your book it's not sort of a separate i mean print on demand hardcover paperback what an amazing technological age that we live in versus you know having to commit to you know a five thousand unit print run or something and and spend all your money there it's like no it's all it's all incremental if somebody wants it i'll just make you know this tiny little royalty on each one i am curious about the audiobook, and then I want to get into the pricing strategy. So did you record this yourself or you found a professional voiceover person? How did the audiobook come into reality? Uh, yeah, so I, I used a professional because I, I didn't think that I had either enough of a, a voice to do it, but also I probably don't have the technology to do it, as in a good enough microphone and um, a booth and everything. I used ACX, which is Amazon's basically Audible, but at the back end of it. So it's kind of like KDP, but for audiobooks. Yes. I can't 100% remember what ACX actually stands for. I want to say audiobook creator exchange, but I could be wrong on that. Yes, I, th- I think you're actually correct. Yes, I just call it ACX. But anyway, it's it's the back end of Audible. And what you can do is either you can you can search for people. So you can search for narrators by you know gender, by accent, whatever. And you can offer them a contract and either you can pay for their services or you can offer them a royalty based contract, which is basically they take part of the royalty and you take part of it, but you don't pay for them to do it. They are doing it in exchange for effectively getting a proportion of the uh, royalties forever, basically. Okay, so I'm going to take on this project speculatively on the hopes that it ends up selling and then I'll get a piece of the pie down the road. Exactly. Okay. In this case, it you know can have taken very long to read. It's a short book. Yeah, exactly. So the the Speedy Sloth books, obviously, I mean, all children's books, I suppose, are relatively short. So some of my children's books I haven't done audio books for because they wouldn't be long enough. It you know it wouldn't take very long. But for the Speedy Sloth one, so I had quite a distinct vision of what I wanted. I wanted it to be a fun audio book, not just a voice, but I wanted music, background music, you know, um, sound effects. So it's more fun. It almost sounds a bit like it could be a cartoon show, but without any of the visual. Okay. That's what I wanted. And so again, I I was sort of the director of that. So I told the illustrator what I want, sorry, the narrator, what I wanted them to do. So I said, I want you to put in this sound effect and, you know, whatever. And I also got them to read out all of the bonus activities and the fact files, because that then obviously padded out the, the time and the word count. Okay. Is anybody buying the audiobook version? Is that a significant portion of the revenue? Yeah, it's, it actually does pretty well. Probably not as many as my actual books, but yeah, it's certainly quite a few people have bought it. And the other reason I think it's actually really useful is because if you've got a professional who's done it, and obviously you've got a nice crisp, clean audio that's got nice sound effects, you can use samples of it. You can't use the whole thing, but you can use samples of it for your own marketing. Okay. So... Like, for example, I've used it on my social media. I've created a YouTube account where I post occasional video clips, but samples, and I I create the visuals myself and then add in the audio underneath and then say, you know, if you want to listen to the full thing, buy it on on Audible or on Amazon. It also is is a good tool just because it gives you some extra marketing materials, not just visuals, but it also gives you, you can create effectively like a mini trailer for your book using those things, as long as you don't give away too much of it. Because obviously the contract is that you are exclusive with Audible. So you obviously you're only allowed to use, I think it's something like 10% of the audio you can use as a sample. Okay. Is there a target royalty that you're aiming for when you uh, go through and price these things in your KDP dashboard? I usually try as a minimum to get at least $1 
US dollar, I'm talking. I mean, I mainly work in dollars, although I'm based in the UK. I do most of my stuff in dollars because of Amazon.com is my highest earning marketplace. Um, but yeah, so I would say a dollar or at least maybe a pound, as in a great British pound. Okay. So I would try and say at least a minimum of that, if not more. I think you've got to be realistic about what people, because obviously the, the higher the price is, obviously the more royalty you get, but the higher the price, the less likely probably people are going to buy it. Okay. So you have to do some competitive research and look at what other people are selling their books for. So make sure that you're in the right range. Was there a track record of revenue at which point you were comfortable calling it quits from the full-time job and say, all right, I'm going to be the full-time sloth guy, freelancer guy. I'm going to make a go of this. So I've been publishing books for about a year while I still had a full-time marketing job. And then I got, and I was doing a little bit of Fiverr as in selling on Fiverr. So as a, as a freelancer, but not very much. And then I I think, cause when, just before COVID here, I kind of had this sort of epiphany that I actually really wanted to do this full time. And I think COVID sort of forced my hand a little bit because I realized I was going to be, you know, in my flat, in my, my apartment, working from home. And that was kind of what I wanted to do anyway. But I was going to be doing something job that I wasn't necessarily as invested in as my book. So that kind of forced my hand. But so I didn't have a number at the time. But you know, I, I kind of thought, well, what actually are my costs? What do I spend per month? And what could I get rid of? You know, what luxuries could I stop in order to you know, be able to live on the money that I'm now earning. So that's kind of, it, like I said, it kind of forced my hand a little bit, but I'm kind of glad that it that happened in a way because I, I probably wouldn't have done it necessarily unless I had had that driving force. Yeah, the bare minimum uh, run rate there. Now I'm on the author page on Amazon and I'm noticing um, there's, a, there's a ton of different books in the portfolio and I'm noticing a ton of different kind of like translated versions of these different titles. Can you talk to me about expanding the portfolio? So I got this Speedy Sloth book out. It it did pretty well, got a great reaction, but now I got to do it again. I got to come up with the next title, the next title. And so there's the Push the Button book. There's a jokes book. There's, you know, part two of the Speedy Sloth. There's all sorts of other titles here. Can you talk about the idea creation process, production process of kind of branching out, expanding this author universe? So... Yeah, the, the languages thing. I mean, so I I speak several languages because I did languages at university, and it's something I've always been interested in. I'd already I thought about it for a while, but I hadn't really gone down the route of actually thinking. Well, could I create, let's say, you know, a German version of the book or a Spanish version of the book? But then someone I know said, "Oh, you know, why don't you create?" Because they're German, they said, "Why don't you create a German version of the book?" My children would love that if it was in German because their English isn't good enough to read the English version. So I just thought, well, actually, yeah, I could do that if I, I do speak German, but I would get a native speaker to do it because you really need someone who's a native speaker. You know, my German's good, but I'm not a native speaker. So yeah, I I got native speakers to do the translations and I did one just to start off with. I did German because German is actually the highest after the US on for Amazon their profits, if you look at Amazon's profits, you know, 80% comes from the US. And then the next one down is actually Germany, okay, even higher than the UK. So I did German first as a test. And I created a German version of the book. And it didn't really take too much effort. I just had to basically just change all of the text out. But other than that, it was pretty simple. And then yeah, did that. I put it up and saw and I got a good reaction from it. And it is, yeah, it's something that I, I actually do get quite a lot of sales from. So it was just figuring out a way of how I can use what I've already got and change it slightly to use it in a different way and as a different revenue stream. Yeah, I like that. I haven't gone through that process. Actually, I had a publisher, you know, can we buy the foreign rights to your book? Like, sure, go, you know, (laughs) right? You're going to send me money for this? Fantastic. I don't speak this language, but that's an interesting way to go to take what you already have rather than starting over completely from scratch to say, okay, what other customers could I potentially reach with this product? What kind of time would you say you're spending on the publishing side today, whether creating new books, marketing the old ones, I guess, versus the freelancing side of the business? Yeah, I would like to spend more time on the publishing side, but because the freelancing is my main revenue um, that has to obviously take priority. But like I said, I work 
probably seven days a week pretty much <laughs> you know sometimes I take days off but I mean you know when you're working for yourself you don't really have days off um so even if it's just maybe an hour or so you know on like a Saturday or a Sunday you still do work even if it's just responding to messages fiver messages or responding to you know whatever it might be so I'd say if I had to do a percentage wise I'd say I probably have to spend you know, 60, 40, maybe on, so 60 towards the freelancing and 40 towards the publishing. But then when I'm doing a book launch, which I've just, so I've just recently launched a book in the last few days, obviously that took up almost a hundred percent of my time for several days. So it really kind of just fluctuates. Which one was that? We got to plug it here. Um, family means dot, dot, dot. So it's just come out, I think three or four days ago. It's going very well. It's it's already been um, a number one new release in its category, which is really exciting. So that's been done really well. So I'm very happy with that. And it's all about you know different types of family, and all families may look may look different or whatever, but they are all the same in the end. It doesn't matter what skin color you are, or what ethnicity, or what where you're from, or whatever. What the makeup of your family is, we're all the same. Okay, that's what the message of the book is. So that was more kind of a nonfiction ish, I suppose you could call it book. So I kind of wanted to expand the portfolio as well, not just doing books about sloths or whatever, but also doing books about real topics and, you know, things like that. So that's something also that that's important to me. Is that what is kind of on the horizon, just to continue cranking out new books on topics that that come into mind? I think so, yeah. With anything, you've got to be interested in what you're doing. So for me, writing the sloth book was really interesting. I really enjoyed doing it. And I, I'm still, you know, I love that book. It's like, I, it's almost like my baby, you know? <laughs> and then I wrote the next book in the series, the speedy sloth, but I also wrote a book about a giraffe with a short neck, which is sort of similar concept in that it's about an animal that's different to the other animals. Okay. And so I was obviously those books at the time were something I was really interested in. It just, those ideas came to me. And then I started to do a couple of other books like the joke book which obviously would be a non-fiction rather than fiction and then that's kind of what I thought well actually you know looking at the different books that are coming out I look at trends quite often of children's books and what's popular and a lot of the books that were coming out I think on the back of a lot of the social movements there are a lot of them were coming out about things like topics like race or sexual orientation or gender and things like that because they're big topics nowadays quite rightly so So that was also a reason why I wanted to do it because I thought, well, actually, that's important to talk about. And it's something that's capturing the zeitgeist, if you like, of society. So yeah, I think that's something I'll do in the future as well, because I think that's done really well. And I've had a really good response from it. Yeah, that makes sense. Kind of keeping pulse on what people are talking about, what makes sense to share and talk to their kids about. Absolutely. For example, when I did the sloth book, although I'd already decided it was going to be a sloth, I think I looked at, you know, you can type in, you know, what animal is trendy this year, you know, whatever. And, you know, a bit like there there are fashion trends for clothes. It's kind of similar for books. So, you know, some years sloths might be really popular. I think a few years ago it was unicorns were really popular and there was a huge explosion of anything with unicorns involved. I feel like every year there's like a new animal or a new thing that is the cool thing. So you kind of have to keep up with that yeah any other future projects that you're excited about i'm currently working on a novel at the moment it's like a a feel-good story you know about a woman who discovers she's inherited a hotel in florida and she flies over from london and you know discovers this whole new life about her uncle who she didn't know you know just something like that and that's an idea that i really am interested in but I'd also like to do lots of children's books. Sam and Speedy Sloth is something I really want to do more of. I want to create a full series out of it and more of these books about, you know, social topics as well, such as, you know, diversity and inclusion. I'd love to just do more books and become a full-time book author and not have to do any freelancing as well. I would like to make my, my money just on children's books. That would be my my dream. Yeah, that seems to be the, uh, the route that you're headed because you create these assets once, you sell them over and over again. It's a fantastic model, but from yourself and a lot of authors that I talk to, it's like, well, it is passive, but you kind of always have to be coming up with the next title and, and doing the thing. But if it's the art that you like to create, then it doesn't feel like work. And you've definitely given me some inspiration to maybe take another crack at these couple of children's books that I've been kicking around for the last 
couple years at least. I got a notes file on my phone similar to to yours with uh, probably started on an airplane actually similarly. So maybe we'll see if I could find an illustrator and make that a reality. Again, mattralphthewriter.com is where you can find links to all of Matt's resources over there. Let's wrap this thing up with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. Does not have to be self-publishing related, just whatever entrepreneurial wisdom that you'd like to impart. Make sure you ask for advice and get advice from people who know what they're doing right from the start, because it will save you so much trouble and time in the future, but also it will mean you'll get better results. You know, there are so many things I wish I had done. And if I had spoken to more people or if I had hired some experts in marketing and book marketing and things like that on Fiverr or wherever it might be, I would have saved myself a lot of time, but I also would have capitalized on a lot of the opportunities that I missed. I like that one. That's a, that's kind of a unique share there. So appreciate you sharing that, Matt. Uh, Thanks so much. And we'll catch up with you soon. Thank you so much. Now, as you just heard, of course, there is a lot that goes into creating a commercially successful book. But I will say, once it's done, it's an asset that can serve you and your readers for years. My own author royalties, which admittedly aren't much to write home about lately, are still some of what I consider my most passive income streams. And I get people all the time saying, oh, I just read your book. I've discovered the Facebook group through this title of yours. And you know, it's no secret of mine that I'm into the idea of creating assets that can be sold over and over again. Kind of like the Etsy printables business we heard about last week, or even creating YouTube videos or blog content, things that have a little bit of natural leverage built in. But publishing is just plain old rewarding work to me. It just, it feels good to put something out there. The title I'm working on this month and truthfully have been in fits and starts for the better part of a year is called 1K 100 Ways, featuring 100 members of this awesome Side Hustle Nation community on how they're making extra money on their own terms. But what do you think? Tap into the power of Amazon with a book or two of your own. If you do go down that path, be sure to download my self-publishing checklist at sidehustlenation.com slash kidsbooks. An important note, applicable for both fiction and nonfiction, kids books and grown-up books. These are the steps you need to consider and check off to go from book idea to successful launch. Once again, you can download that for free at sidehustlenation.com slash kidsbooks, where you'll also find all the links and resources from today's episode. Big thanks to Matt for sharing his insight. That's it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen. And I'll catch you in the next edition of The Side Hustle Show. Hustle on.